Good day, everyone. Uh, good evening. Um, my name is Jake Kennedy, and I'm totally honored to to read this piece for a brick um, uh, on Twelve Monkeys on Terry Gilliam's Twelve Monkeys. So thanks so much for for having me here on Twelve Monkeys. There's a fair bit of totally naked. Bruce Willis getting fire hosed and then scrubbed down with push brooms and 12 monkeys. The scrubbing is how you know you're watching a film about a deadly virus. Brad Pitt is in this movie and he plays a kooky, fortunate son. We know this in part because one of his eyes is wonky. And also he slaps his head a lot to kickstart his kooky brain. The film is about a virus released by a mad scientist. We know he's unhinged because he has a tendency to leer and because he rocks a very ill-advised ponytail. So a virus is anything contained inside a vacuum sealed test tube that you're trying to sneak by airport security. A virus is also a virus because it's indistinguishable from the air or it's the specific part of the air that's totally fucking evil. My friend P texts to confess it's a monkey's paw situation. That is, P too wished for the end of the world and he and Burgess Meredith got it. P writes to me, just try reading civilization's greatest books when your specs are busted and you're dying of viral fuckery too. And my partner says during one of our walks through our quiet town, every day is now Sunday, until another sensation arises, the subtle but all-pervading pleasure of feeling the ghosts of the old routines and measures and gatherings and expectations, a past tense that's alive. There is a kind of terror piece to the lockdown world, rendering it all our own letterbox film. Today, I looked at it for a while and heard wood blocks being knocked together, two men building a house, a sound I associate with Japanese films, ominous but also lovely, the sound of reverie and suspense, that is, of the dappled light when the woodcutter, before any horror or confusion ensues, walks through the pine grove and Rashomon. In La Jete, uh, Terry Gilliam's inspiration for 12 Monkeys, Chris Marker has his time traveler visit the Jardin de Plantes and point beyond the rings of the great Sequoia. This is where I come from, he says to his lover. Maybe Marker made the film so we could understand what it's like to live in the gauzy stasis of a pandemic. Still image after still image of the what used to be day after day of motionless life. Though if you look close enough at your beloved slumbering in your bed, then you might be able to see them just once, open their eyes and breathe. Hey there, I'm Jim Shepard and this is on 28 Weeks Later. It's a measure of how underrated Juan Carlos Fresnadillo's 28 Weeks Later is, that when I recommend it to people, they're often startled. There are probably a couple of good reasons for that. First, horror as a genre seems a little grindhouse to some, and second, it's a sequel to a movie that would seem to outshine it, Danny Boyle's 28 Days Later, the critical and financial success that transformed, if not created, the modern zombie subgenre, mostly through the innovation of sprinting zombies. The shufflingly slow, reanimated corpses that could be avoided by a brisk walk in Night of the Living Dead had, in 28 days later, become rabid, rabid dervishes animated by a rage virus. Well, there's a shift. At that movie's release, it felt terrifyingly as though someone had changed the rules and not informed the audience. The story picks up in 28 weeks later with the virus having burned itself out in a lockdown Britain after having taken most of the population with it. America, as it so often has, 
is leading the reconstruction and repatriation of those lucky few who'd escaped abroad. That project centered around a secure green zone, and those alert to political resonances might intuit how that hubris will play itself out. But prior to that exposition, the spectacular set piece that opens the movie makes clear where its real energies are concentrated. We start with husband and wife, Don and Alice, hunkered down with others in a barricaded farmhouse while a virus is still raging. Don's love is some help, but what really mitigates Alice's despair is her relief that their two children happened to be on a school trip on the continent when the shitstorm hit. She makes clear that they are everything to her, and he agrees. They're then jolted by banging and crying from outside, a child's voice begging for shelter. Don counsels ignoring the pleas, given the circumstances, but Alice protests Don, it's a kid, and opens the door. The boy informs them his mom and dad, along with any number of others, were chasing and trying to kill him. Sure enough, the house is breached by his pursuers and Don and Alice are separated because she won't abandon the boy who's trying to hide. She has a split second to decide between Don, who's offering the safety of a window to exit, and the boy, and she chooses the boy, just as the raged virus zombies burst into the room. Don then has the same split second to make the same decision. He decides the other way and climbs out the window. Once on the ground and running, he looks back to glimpse Alice at the window with the kind of expression you might expect on a wife who's just seen her loving husband do what Don did. Before she's ripped from view, he and we can see clearly her horrified revelation that, oh my God, he's the monster. But wait, when it comes to the betrayal of those we claim we most love, it gets worse. The virus seemingly gone, Don's kids return from abroad, and he tells them that there was nothing he could have done to save their mother. The kids leave the safe zone surreptitiously to visit their old home in search of mementos, and they find their mother, feral with shock, still living in the attic. It turns out that she's been bitten but hasn't transformed. She's a carrier, but also a key to treating the virus. Don's joy at her survival is mitigated somewhat by his spectacular guilt, and he sneaks into the facility where the military has now isolated her, hoping against all odds for forgiveness and an indication that she won't expose his betrayal to the kids. While he's apologizing, she gazes at him with a frightening implacability and tells him she loves him. Hugely relieved, he kisses her and is nearly immediately rocked by the virus and we register that she knew this would happen. We then see her realize the ramifications of that for her as he transforms. After she's killed and he initiates the virus's breakout within the green zone, the viewer is jarred by the further revelation that Don's not just a bestial thing butchering at random. He's actually hunting his children. They've looked at him subsequent to his transformation the same searing way that Alice did. So his rage at the judgment he saw in his wife's eyes now has a target. The movie insists on the family as the primary source of solace and dread. Whereas in Night of the Living Dead, the living were in danger from their loved ones because their loved ones no longer recognized them. In 28 weeks later, the living find themselves in danger because their loved ones do recognize them. Don and Alice's children, too, as they seek to protect each other, end up endangering the world. Love and compassion in such a malevolent context are turned against them. Connection may be everything, but those same intimacies that establish our humanity help initiate our catastrophes.